Hello, my name is Helga Edwards. In this presentation, I plan to give you helpful information about dealing with shame and understanding addiction, specifically sex addiction. As humans, we're made up of four parts, the physical, the emotional, the cognitive, and the spiritual. I plan to focus on the emotional, the cognitive, and the spiritual from a Christian perspective. So first of all, I want to focus specifically on guilt and shame. It is important to differentiate between true guilt, false guilt, and shame. Now shame is what we believe about ourselves, about who we are, our identity. And sometimes when certain things are triggered, a part of us feels like I'm a bad person, or worthless, or not good enough, or I'm nothing, or I'm unlovable, or I'm not wanted, or I'm just a piece of garbage. These are all very common shame messages. And the truth is, we all have shame messages because children have something that's called magical thinking. No child grows up in a perfect family. No child has perfect parents. And whenever there is a problem, children blame themselves. It's something they have to do to have a sense of control of their world. Otherwise, it's too scary. If they think adults can just leave, or someone can just die, or someone can just hurt them who's bigger than them, that is very frightening. Children, in a way, have to blame themselves in order to have a sense of hope and control over their world, because if it's their fault, then if they change, then maybe they can stop the behavior. So even though if there's a divorce and we tell the kids it's not their fault, usually young children, a part of them still hold on to the fact that maybe if I was good enough, and maybe if I become good enough, I can fix things. And a part of them almost has to hold on to that until they're older and can work through it. However, they still need to be told, obviously, that it's not their fault and get help in that way. But this magical thinking is becomes a real problem in the area of shame because when we blame ourselves for circumstances beyond our control or for what other people say or do, then this results in shame. Now when we have shame, a core sense of shame, which at some level we all do, we look to cover this because it's quite unbearable to feel this. It's quite unbearable and intolerable. So in a subconscious way, we look for ways to hide or cover that sense of shame. So often we look to perfectionism, to our performance or appearance. So we think, you know what, maybe if I get really good marks in school, or maybe if I really help mom with this, or, or appear this way to my friends, you know, then maybe they'll think I'm good enough. Sometimes we look to relationships, having the perfect partner, the perfect boyfriend or girlfriend, or always having a per, uh, uh, boyfriend or girlfriend, then that can make us feel that, you know what, maybe I'm good enough then. Sometimes rescuing behavior, we talked about that in the last presentation, um, taking care of other people, trying to fix other people, it, that is a way of trying to cover our sense of shame. Sometimes we look to ourselves. Sometimes we have almost like an inner protector, a part of us that sabotages relationships to protect us from rejection because we think if they really get to know me and they really see how bad and worthless I am, they're going to walk away anyway, so I need to push people away. Or some people look to themselves to try to control all their thoughts and feelings, keep them all under control so that other people won't abuse them. The other thing people look to is sometimes money or things. So we all have something we look to to try to cover a core sense of shame. And what happens though, it's, it's all based on fear. And what happens is this ends up trying controlling us. It ends up controlling us. So what we have to understand is that these messages are lies. That these messages are something called introjects that they come from outside of ourselves. They are not who we are. They come from either what others have said to us, or how we were treated, or what happened to us. Or it can be how we interpreted things growing up. But they come from outside of us because none of these things are true about anyone. 
The truth is, we have intrinsic value because we're human beings. Our value is inside. It is not based on having a relationship with someone. It is not based on being, on being perfect or performing or appearing perfect. It is not based on having money or things. Our value is intrinsic. It's because we're human beings and we're loved by our Creator. So my value as a person is not connected to what I experienced or what was done to me either. My worth as a person or value is not connected to anything external. It is about my value as a human being. The other thing we need to look at, that the lie that we need to look at is false guilt. A lot of people feel guilty about things that we're, there's no guilt about. Some people feel guilty about their feelings. We can't help feeling the way we do. If we're angry about something, we're angry. If we're sad about something, we're sad. If something scares us, it scares us. There is no guilt for automatic feelings. Temptations. Jesus was tempted too. Well, we can have all kinds of temptations, but the temptations are not wrong. There is no guilt around temptations. Our automatic thoughts, there's no guilt around those as well. What others say and do, no guilt around that. And other circumstances beyond our control. If we feel guilt around these things, we need to recognize the lie, and we need to be able to label it as false guilt. And then we need to look at what is true guilt. Well, true guilt is about the choices we make and about our behavior. So true guilt can be around what I do, what I say, and what thoughts I choose to focus on. We can have true guilt around those things. Now just a, a word about thoughts. Thoughts kind of float, float through our heads, float through our minds, and they can come from who knows where. We can have all kinds of thoughts. Now, sometimes, you know, sometimes there's very strange thoughts and we just go, oh, that's strange, and we let it go. But sometimes, if we're having this thought that, you know, I'm a really bad person and a, a thought goes through our mind that scares us and makes us think, oh my goodness, this thought, why am I thinking this thought? That the, the shame can hook the thought and kind of keep it there. And then it's hard to let go of it because the fear around the shame keeps the thought there, because we're thinking, why is that thought there? What does that mean about me? Does that mean I'm really as bad as I think I am? And there's all kinds of fear that can keep that thought there. Now, there is a test that you can do to determine whether that thought is really yours. Is it really something about true guilt, or is it more connected with false guilt and shame? The question is, would I choose this thought with my free will? And a lot of people would say, no way, I don't want these thoughts, I wouldn't choose these thoughts. Well then, it's not your thought, and truly there is no guilt around it. What we need to do, if it's such a thought, is deal with the shame lie, and even the false guilt of the automatic thoughts, and then we can let go of that thought. As soon as we're aware of a thought that we know is destructive, then we can say, oh, well I'm, you know, I'm going to focus on something else. I'm not going to choose to focus on that. So as soon as we become aware of it, and if we choose to focus on another thought and reject that thought, there's no guilt. There's no guilt. Now, if we become aware of a thought and say, ooh, I probably shouldn't really focus on this. It's a destructive thought. But I kind of like the way it makes me feel. Well, then you know what? Then we've chosen to focus on a thought that we know isn't in our best interest. And then there's some true guilt around that. So the truth is, the truth is God came to deliver us from all guilt, from true guilt, to expose false guilt, and to expose the lie of shame. That's the good news of the gospel is that we're free. We're free from all guilt and all shame. So with true guilt, what do we do? Well, God says, all we have to do is be honest about it, is to, be say, is to be able to say, God, you know what? I said that, and that was wrong, and I'm sorry, and I'm going to stop doing that. Would you forgive me? And then it's done. There is no guilt. Or we can say, God, I did this. I'm sorry. It, it was my choice to do that. I'm going to stop. I don't know how to stop, 
Would you please show me? I will do whatever I need to do to work on stopping this. Please forgive me. Then it's gone. It's forgiven. So the cross and forgiveness is there for anything we say, anything we do, and any thoughts we have chosen to focus on. Some people allow themselves to be abused or they abuse themselves because they have so much guilt and shame. But Jesus took that punishment for our real guilt. He took it on the cross so we can be free from guilt. And so we can know we are completely forgiven for any mistakes or wrong choices we have made. Jesus went to the cross willingly. He didn't have to, but he chose to, which shows our incredible value in God's eyes. The, sh the shame messages that we have received are in fact the exact opposite of the truth. We are always loved, valued, special and cherished by God, no matter what we've done or haven't done. So instead of looking to performance, other people, ourselves, things or addictions to hide from our sense of shame, we can look to God to erase the lie of shame, to take away all our guilt, that is exactly what he came to do. And now I'd like to focus on addictions. And the reason I included shame in this presentation is because shame is a big part of many addictions. I'm going to focus specifically on sex addiction, but almost everything I talk about can be applied to other addictions as well. So, for sex addiction, there are three criteria. First of all, there is a loss of control. It's like you don't have the ability to freely choose whether to stop or to continue the behavior. You want to try and stop the behavior, but you find you can't. Number two, there's a continuation of the behavior, even though you experience very negative consequences. Now, some consequences show up in the, in the latter stages of addiction, such as broken relationships, financial problems, job or health problems, even arrests sometimes. And thirdly, there's an obsession or preoccupation with the activity. You're always thinking about it, thinking about getting it, using it, or recovering from the behavior. So three things, a loss of control, not being able to stop a continuation of the behavior even though you experience very negative consequences. And third, an obsession or preoccupation with the activity.